Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to this online policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center and the United States Mission to the European Union. This is the first um, public debate that I'm moderating uh, after the summer break, um, and I hope to um, inaugurate uh, the new events uh, season with an interesting and constructive uh, exchange today. The ingredients for, for a lively and relevant debate are certainly in place. First, we have a topical subject for discussion, um, the EU facilitated talks for the normalization of relations between Belgrade and Pristina, a process that has been going on for what now, uh, more than a decade, with plenty of sensitivities, controversies, and challenges, but also with important implications for the two sides, uh, for the region and beyond. Second, uh, we have a sizable audience uh, with over um, 100 participants tuned to listen to us today. So thank you very much to those who, uh, who joined us. And third, of course, we have a star-studded panel of speakers to help us make sense of the state of play, uh, to help us work out the uh, positions of the different stakeholders and help us get an idea of what we can expect next. It is thus with great pleasure uh, that I can introduce to you Gabriel Escobar, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs at the US Department of State, Miroslav Lajczak, the EU Special Representative for the Pristina Belgrade Dialogue, and Donika Emini, Executive Director at Platforma Civicos in Kosovo and member of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. Uh, Ms. Viola from Kreiman Tobadel, uh, member of the European Parliament in the Group of Greens European Free Alliance is hopefully going to join us, uh, join our panel as well shortly. She has been delayed due to um, some previous uh, uh, engagements. I'm very grateful um, to all of our speakers for making time uh, to be with us here. So uh, a very warm welcome to, to them as well. As always, we will first hear uh, from our distinguished panelists, and then I will open the floor for uh, Q&A with our, with our audience. Comments uh, and questions from our participants are welcome in written in our chat box um, on this platform at any time during the meeting. So let's get started. I propose that we begin with the US perspective and then we zoom progressively in. Mr. Escobar, what are the main features of the United States approach towards Kosovo and Serbia-Kosovo uh, relations since the change of administration in Washington? In particular, what is the strategy that the US follows to advance the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade? And to what extent does this strategy align with the efforts undertaken by the European Union um, in, in the same area? Mr. Escobar, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. <clears throat> and thank you very much to the European Policy Center for this uh, opportunity, to, opportunity to speak to the public. This is my first uh, public event uh, since taking the job. So thank you for uh, uh, being the, my inaugural uh, introduction to the public. So uh, I want to start by saying that um, our policy uh, for the Western Balkans, uh, not just for Serbia and Kosovo, but for the whole region, is that we'd like to see them as part of the European Union, full stop. And from our perspective, they are part of Europe. Uh, they're historically part of Europe. They have been uh, allies in two world wars. They helped us defeat, many of them helped us defeat fascism. During the Cold War, they were uh, neutral and uh, occasionally helpful. Uh, during the, the War on Terror, many of them uh, participated in some of our efforts to uh, defeat uh, extremism. Uh, even now, you see many of the, the countries of the region helping us with the, uh, the question of Afghanistan. And even before that, uh, you saw many of them helping uh, Europe with the question of, uh, of migration after the Syrian conflict, during the Syrian conflict. So in essence, uh, historically, uh, this part of the world is Europe. Culturally, socially, they're Europe. They, uh, they have uh, large diasporas that contribute a lot to Europe and to the United States as well. Uh, uh, 
the people of the region see their futures uh, as linked to Europe culturally and economically uh, for the region, at least 70% of the trade goes to Europe. We, we talk a lot about uh, Chinese investment in the region, but it is actually absolutely dwarfed uh, even bilaterally by some of the countries of Europe. So uh, from our perspective, and uh, this has not changed over uh, administrations, uh, the region is European. And uh, our message uh, to Europe is that there is very little risk in enlargement to, uh, to these countries, that uh, for 20 million people, uh, which is a small part of Europe, they are probably a good bet. And I hope that member states understand that uh, they should be part of Europe. They are part of Europe culturally and, and historically. Uh, for the countries of the region, uh, our message is the same, that uh, we believe that European candidacy is uh, the, the way to go. That is their future. European Union membership um, brings enormous benefits. And, and in my lifetime, I would say that the, uh, one of the most impressive uh, historical accomplishments has been the enlargement of the European Union. Every country that's entered the European Union has become more democratic, more stable, and more prosperous with almost no cost to the rest of the members. So even the idea of becoming a candidate has uh, created some incredible incentives for countries to make democratic and, um, and economic reforms that are, are very positive. And so my message uh, to the people of the region uh, is that you should have a voice in this community, which is so important to you. Um, and that uh, the political cost the politic uh, of making the reforms necessary to accomplish that uh, successful candidacies is very much worth it. So uh, operationally, what this means for us is that we are going to work hand in hand with our European colleagues to, uh, to convince both sides that this is, this is the only possible way, the only future uh, for, for the Western Balkans. And so as we move forward, uh, we are going to support uh, the efforts of the EU-led dialogue in bringing uh, Serbia and Kosovo closer to the European Union, and then work with uh, the European Union to bring the rest of the region uh, into, into the, um, the European Union. Uh, and that includes uh, providing a very strong signal for Albania and Macedonia, who are already in my opinion, uh, uh, need to be encouraged further, including resolving the differences between North Macedonia and, and Bulgaria. But beyond that, I, the, the, from my perspective, having just left Belgrade, uh, I will differ a little bit with some of my colleagues here in the department in that I see a tremendous amount of optimism coming out of the region right now. Uh, while uh, the, the last, as we enter the, four, the fourth decade after the end of, of uh, the Bosnian War, uh, we are not, the, the, the region should not be entirely defined by political questions. The, uh, there is a tremendous economic dynamism that is occurring in the region and uh, a, a tremendous amount of integration among the countries of the Western Balkans that are not part of the European Union in ways that I think we should encourage. And it is an important part of, of Europe with 125 billion GDP, 20 million uh, uh, inhabitants, in some cases, five up to 5% growth. It is one of the fastest growing regions in Europe. Um, and uh, that alone is one of the reasons why Europe needs the region and why the region needs more Europe in order to encourage uh, the, the standards and, and regulatory and legal practices that will make them an attractive member. So I want to leave uh, the panel with this idea that uh, the new administration is going to focus very much on a very consistent uh, message that uh, the, the region must be part of the European Union. It must make the reforms necessary to be part of the European Union. But we see tremendous economic opportunities in the region that I think could lead to confidence building and greater um, ethnic reconciliation in the region. And I'll stop there uh, and uh, leave it to my other colleagues to, to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Escobar. Um, 
as far as I understand you, you're presenting enlargement as a win-win exercise. Um, and if that's so, um, how do you think that the lack of progress uh, on this dossier, uh, you've mentioned Albania, North Macedonia, but uh, uh, the, the dialogue between uh, Pristina and Belgrade, as well as Bosnia Herzegovina are, are other big um, uh, stumbling blocks in this process. Do you think that uh, those could have security repercussions. Are you worried about the um, uh, the, the slow progress of things um, in on enlargement that we're witnessing? I am worried about it. I, I'm worried about uh, the lack of confidence that the public in the region has in in the message that they uh, that uh, enlargement is a possibility for them. I'm worried about um, the lack of the strong message uh, that Europe is providing the region. Um, but I'm also a little bit uh, concerned about um, the, uh, the way in which uh, there doesn't seem to be more uh, support for our European colleagues who are working on this issue. So uh, I'm hoping that under this administration, and, and I personally uh, uh, pledge myself. Support from whom? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I would say from, from member states in okay. particular uh, about giving a strong message that enlargement is a possibility, mm -hmm. that these uh, issues are very important to Europe. Uh, and my hope and my, my aim is to throw my full weight and support behind those European uh, uh, officials who are working to make a difference in, in the Western Balkans. So you'll see me uh, working as hard as I can with them to give that message of, of uh, renewed energy on, on all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Escobar. Mr. Lajcek, um, I'm sure you uh, will want to react to what has just been said and, uh, and tell us how, um, uh, the mem how we can persuade the member states to get with the program when it comes to enlargement. But uh, more on the topic of today's um, um, event, we know that the high-level Pristina Belgrade dialogue has resumed this year, and already um, we had um, the two sides meet uh, a couple of times what has been discussed so far? Can you speak? Can we speak of um, of any progress yet? And and what are the key challenges um, that the process faces uh, in your opinion? Yes, of course. Uh, and first of all, Ted, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this discussion. And I'm very much looking forward to exchanging views with other participants in this panel. Uh, you know that as the EU special representative. Uh, I'm tasked to facilitate the negotiations on a comprehensive normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, I took over the dialogue when it entered it, its 10, 10th years of existence. It was back in 2011 when the United Nations General Assembly basically transferred uh, the responsibility for this dialogue to the European Union, uh, clearly expressing there's a strong link between the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia and their European future. And that's exactly a reason why European Union is in the lead of this process, because uh, we see uh, Kosovo, Serbia and the entire Western Balkans region as the future members of the European Union. And uh, of course, we want to contribute to this process, including uh, through the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. I would also like to remind ourselves that uh, during these 10 years, the dialogue has produced number of very concrete results, which are good for the lives of people uh, in Kosovo in particular. And uh, let me uh, mention a few of them. Uh, municipal elections have been held in the North under the Kosovo law since 2014, thanks to an agreement reached under the dialogue's auspices. An agreement has guaranteed the orderly free travel for Kosovars to Serbia, including trans transit with the documents issued by Kosovo, including for Kosovo registered vehicles using uh, license plates. Uh, third, the, thanks to dialogue agreements, Kosovo is able to effectively exercise control over its territory and the border or boundary line through establishment of common crossing points. And also it collects significant financial revenues from trade with Serbia or goods transiting via Serbia. It's happening thanks to the dialogue. Number four, parallel Serbian police and judicial structures 
including their staff, have been integrated into the Kosovo system, thanks to the dialogue agreement. Information exchange in legal matters between Kosovo and Serbia has also been set up. The next point, Kosovo received its own dialogue code uh, with the telecoms agreement, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, apart from having a symbolic meaning, also brought significant financial savings, as Kosovo no longer depends on services from other countries. And also, thanks to the dialogue, Kosovo can participate as a full-fledged member in different regional initiatives, organizations, and events. And I can also mention an agreement on the return of certified copies of the original displayed civil records that have supported the establishment of a reliable civil registry in Kosovo. So these are this is not the full list, but these are some of the elements that clearly answer the, the question why dialogue is not only important, but why dialogue is also good uh, for Kosovo. Uh, of course, work is far from over, and that's why the European Union decided in, to, in to last year, in 2020, to establish a position of the EU special representative with a senior figure uh, to be in charge of this process on a permanent basis. And uh, uh, of course, we launched the process after 20 years of uh, pause when there was no dialogue. Uh, we launched the process with the previous government. Then, of course, we, we had to take a break uh, because of the internal developments in Kosovo, early parliamentary elections or a formation of a new government. Now, uh, what I want to stress is that uh, with the Prime Minister Kurti and his government, we have a partner with a very strong mandate who can deliver on such a historic deal, uh, such as the comprehensive agreement on normalization of relations. And of course, uh, this uh, uh, normalization will also help Prime Minister to reach his ultimate internal goals, which is uh, jobs and justice, the rule of law, and of course, boost the economy. I also want to stress that uh, everything we have ever achieved in the Western Balkans, we meaning the European Union, has only been, been possible thanks to the closest cooperation with the United States. We have a history of uh, successes every time we work closely together because we share the same objectives and the values we just uh, heard uh, Gabriel Escobar saying very uh, clearly uh, uh, how supportive United States are of the European membership of, of, the, of the Western Balkans region. And with the arrival of the President Biden's administration, we have the closest and best possible cooperation with our American friends. We have already been in touch with uh, Gabriel, and of course we will continue working very closely together, the same as I uh, had worked with his predecessor. So. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, I am not hiding that uh, uh, right now uh, the enlargement is not on the top of the list of European Union's priorities. Uh, it is uh, not made by decision. It simply uh, is the re uh, uh, result of, of the fact that the European Union has to uh, deal with so many unexpected issues. Right now, of course, it's the pandemics before we had Brexit, before we had a migration crisis, before we had a financial crisis. So uh, it's, I think it's logical uh, that it's not the most prominent issue, but no one has ever said that enlargement is, is not, not anymore one of the strategic goals of the European Union. I would also say that it uh, puts more pressure on our future members because they need to prove that they are, they are and will be part of the solution and not part of the problem. That means they will contribute to, their, to the functionality of the European Union. And of course, having normalized relations uh, between and among themselves and having a very good regional cooperation is a very strong uh, proof of the fact that they are ready to enter even deeper and higher level of, of integration. So I think I will stop here and I will uh, look forward to, to listen to the other participants. Thank you so much. Um, just to follow up with the question um, uh, which one of our participants uh, sent in, uh, it's coming from Nicholas White and he's, um, uh, he's asking you, um, has any progress been made on the return of the original cadastral records from Serbia to Kosovo? It is a crucial element of normalization. And I'm asking you this because you specified very concrete results of the dialogue. And to his question, maybe I can ask, add half uh, of another question, which is, we have all these agreements that have been struck, but what about their implementation? Where are we um, on implementing all of these breakthroughs? 
Yes, uh, since 2011, uh, Kosovo and Serbia agreed on a number of uh, agreements, and I already mentioned some of those who are producing results. Uh, some of them have been uh, implemented uh, partially. Uh, some of them are yet to be implemented. But uh, the way we approach the, the dialogue is that we are addressing two tasks in parallel. The first one is to agree on the text of the comprehensive uh, normaliza normalization agreement. And at the same time, in parallel, addressing all past agreements and uh, making sure that they are implemented. And, uh, and thus, we are solving uh, all outstanding issues. And uh, the, the dialogue on, uh, sorry, the agreement on cadastre is one of those agreements. It was signed already in 2011. And uh, uh, there are elements that, that are yet to be fulfilled. We've discussed this extensively uh, last year. Uh, but now we are in a new situation and with the Prime Minister Kurti and, and First Deputy Prime Minister Bislimi, we are discussing or uh, uh, re, uh, I would say reshaping the course of the dialogue so that it also reflects their expectations and their priorities, uh, while obviously uh, insisting that everything that was agreed in the past must be implemented by both parties. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we should move on and I'm very happy to see that uh, Ms. Cremon is finally with us. Welcome. Uh, we're really happy and grateful that uh, you could make it um, in the end. Um, and so I'll turn to you, Ms. Cremon, if I, if I may. Uh, you are a rapporteur on Kosovo and shadow rapporteur on Serbia in the European Parliament. So you follow uh, very closely developments within and between the, the two parties. So if you only listen to some of the statements that come from, from the highest political level, both in Serbia and Kosovo, the two sides seem to be quite far apart in their approach and even in their understanding of, uh, of, of what this dialogue is all about. So where do you see a room for compromise and how confident are you that the process can actually lead to the normalization of relations between uh, Belgrade and Pristina? Thank you very much, Corinna, for having me and giving me the opportunity to contribute to this uh, uh, very great and very fruitful debate. And also, thank you very much uh, to Mr. Escobar and also to our special um, envoy or special representative, uh, Mr. Leitscheik. I think it was a very positive outlook and it was a very inspiring um, outlook uh, for, for the next uh, weeks and months to come. Well, yes, I mean, if you are on the ground, if you talk to the interlocutors uh, in Belgrade or Pristina, uh, it looks as if it will never happen. So the, let's say the upcoming elections in both of the country um, do not make, um, let's say, this normalization process much easier. And as a politician, of course, I have a I wouldn't say a lot of sympathy, but I have an understanding why it is like this. Um, uh, as Mr. Leitschak has rightly said, Alvin Kurti, the prime minister, has a strong mandate for the first time. He has a majority in the National Assembly of Kosovo, and one would expect you would also use this uh, for the dialogue. But so far, I think the upcoming municipal elections in Kosovo, they were um, dated or they were... Um, scheduled for the 17th of October due to Corona. We are not so sure whether they can stick to this. So there might be uh, a little bit of a postponement in that. And this would also understand or would also um, explain why the whole process uh, is, is stuck again. The next uh, um, date, uh, political wise, will be probably the parliamentary election, presidential election on the Serbian side, probably scheduled for next April the 3rd. And until then, uh, I don't think we'll see much of a compromise attitude from the Serbian side. Even we know that the Serbian president had and has all the leverage uh, to cover a lot of uh, project and could even go forward with a two third majority in the parliament and also with a, let's say, a large support uh, from, from, from his uh, population, from his citizens. And of course, uh, since he has uh, the force and the power to use 
the media in a much, let's say, more intense uh, sense than the uh, prime minister in Kosovo has it. He could also uh, message through these media channels what would be necessary for this normalization uh, process. Uh, with, uh, with Kosovo. So a lot depends on the political actors and a lot depends on the political will from both sides. Uh, knowing this and also knowing that we come across and we, that we come along uh, with a huge investment program that we come um, along with the EPA funds, it would be also, I think, appropriate to have a stricter conditionality when it comes to the money. Yeah? So on one hand, of course, we would like to see uh, democratization in both of the countries, but on the other hand, I think we should also uh, keep a close eye on how can we use this money, this investment funds, to uh, put a little bit more political pressure also on, on the uh, actors on the ground. Um, I think it is good that uh, Mr. Leishek has um, listed some of the achievements. We have seen a couple of achievements. Not everything is implemented as it could be. But it is also uh, true that since 15, there was almost no uh, progress at all in the dialogue. And of course, the frustration, and this is what Mr. Escobar has said as well, the frustration regarding the entire enlargement process, the credibility of the uh, European Union as such, is, uh, um, um, I would say, um, how to uh, frame it, not too blunt, but pretty much uh, ruined or uh, vile or, or um, nah, um, damaged uh, in a way that some of, uh, especially the younger generation, at least in Kosovo, does not believe uh, that this process could be successful in the end. So they think even if we go for more reforms, even if we push um, uh, the country, the society, the institutions, the judiciary, uh, the, the agency and so forth for more reforms, which most of them think it is okay and this is necessary, but nevertheless, um, uh, with the visa liberalization process, they have seen uh, even after the reforms, even everything is uh, implemented, there will be no visa liberalization. And a little bit, it is now the question with the next step in the dialogue. And people ask me again and again, why should we go for more reforms if in the end uh, we will stand in there with empty hands and we cannot really convince our societies, our political uh, supporters and so on to um, move forward. I would always answer, well, it, you don't do these reforms for us, you do this for your country, you do this for your citizens, uh, even if you never get, uh, I, I hope it, it's not true, but even you will never have uh, the visa-free regime for foreign direct investment, for everything which is related to, to the business uh, community, to the economy, it will be necessary to fight corruption, to go against uh, organized crime, to have an independent judiciary and so on and so forth. So no matter what comes up uh, in the, let's say, foreign policy sector, you should take care of all the reforms which are on your agenda, also when it comes to electoral code and so on. So um, I would say, yes, there are some pros, but unfortunately there are also a lot of, of, of cons and there are a lot of minuses. And, and people, especially the younger generation, especially in Kosovo, but also in parts of, of Serbia, are rather frustrated. Since I took my summer break also to visit the Albanian minority um, in, in the south of Serbia, I was surprised to see this process of passivization. And I would address this directly to Mr. Lechuk, that we have a close eye and keep a close eye on what's going on and what the systematic approach uh, would be used from the Serbian side in this negotiation of the normalization of, uh, of the relations. This is a very uh, um, concerning uh, um, development. And uh, it looks as if, of course, uh, the uh, government of, of Serbia would like to, uh, let's say, uh, would like to diminish the sheer number of Albanian minority in Serbia. And this is, of course, nothing which could be in our interest, neither in the interest of, of, of the Albanians as such. But nevertheless, it was interesting to listen. Uh, they are not satisfied at all with the process, neither are the Serbs in the north. And I have asked them to actually 
to put their forces together, Serbs in the north of Kosovo with the uh, Albanian minorities in the south, and maybe found a strategy and find a strategy how to overcome uh, the, let's say, uh, um, uh, the blockade on both uh, governmental sides, and uh, they thought they might uh, uh, think about that, and this would be also something for us to maybe create uh, create this uh, this room, this potential for having side negotiations for the minorities, not just look at the Serbian side, but look also on the Albanian side and Serbia to have the same rights for both minorities or for all the minorities in the respected countries. Thank you. This would be my short introduction for now. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting indeed. Um, of course, you mentioned that um, doing reforms is, is good for those countries, even if the rewards uh, uh, let themselves uh, await it. Uh, but the question, I think, remains of whether it is good for the EU uh, not to deliver on its end of the bargain and uh, uh, what, um, what it means delaying all of these uh, rewards, not just uh, for Kosovo, but also, as we've spoken earlier, for Albania, North Macedonia, and so on, what, what all this means uh, uh, for the credibility of the uh, EU and, and, and of its policy towards the region. Um, just to be fair towards our participants, I will follow up to you with a, uh, a question that has already been posed in, in writing um, regarding the final goal of this dialogue. Um, is mutual recognition between Kosovo and Serbia the point of this all? What kind of hard compromise um, are you hoping uh, uh, from these two states? And of course, since I'm addressing it to you, it's your personal opinion uh, um, on this issue. Uh, well, if you ask me, yes, of course, everything else would be a disappointment. Um, and I think uh, we are pretty clear in this. Of course, there is not a, um, a unique position or not a union, not a, a anonymous position in the European Union so far, but I would hope that uh, when we come closer to the end of the negotiations that we could imagine to have one or the other country also recognizing um, Kosovo and then hopefully we would find a process where in the end the European Union um, as an entire institution could agree uh, on this as well. Thank you very much. My dearest Donika, um, I come to you now. Um, a lot has already been said about today's, uh, today's topic, but of course uh, you have a, a very specific insight because you come from the region, uh, you, you've lived uh, most of your life in Kosovo, I, I, I assume, and um, you've dealt firsthand with, uh, with the practicalities and implications of this ongoing enmity between Kosovo and Serbia. What can you tell us then about Kosovo's position in, in this process, uh, at, especially at present, given um, uh, uh, the government? And how do you view this dialogue um, and its prospects? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to be part of this panel discussion. And I am happy that I am immediately after uh, Viola, especially because she brought a uh, perspective that is semi, uh, you know, regional and semi EU. So, you know, halfway through basically paved the way to, uh, to my intervention. Um, I mean, clearly this, uh, this for most of you is a career opportunity for us, it's our life. And uh, uh, this is uh, every outcome, every event in the framework of the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue di directly impacts the lives uh, of, of citizens in Kosovo-Serbia and the region. Uh, and uh, when I was, uh, I mean, listening to all the interventions, uh, I do agree with the success, the level of success that, uh, that the dialogue has had so far. I mean, uh, basically, we do not stand at the situation we were back in 2008. Uh, but uh, but uh, given the time frame, uh, it could have been done more and, uh, and in a in different way. Uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, that's why. And th that explains also the dissatisfaction of people towards the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia, but also the EU enlargement process in general. 
I mean, uh, if you if you look at the Kosovo perspective, uh, the things are changing with the new government in Kosovo, which not only has a full legitimacy, but we are talking about you uh, about a political elite which is not linked to the past, uh, a, a brand new political elite uh, in a way which has never been part of uh, executive, uh, ex excluding uh, Mr. Osmani, who has been working for uh, the former president of Kosovo, uh, but she never has been in the executive power before. So we are having a forward looking new elite, which is different from uh, what we uh, usually see in the Western Balkans. So basically from the Kosovo side, there is hope that things might change uh, positively. So this is, a, um, in, in this regard, this is a very good turning point uh, for not only uh, uh, the, uh, the dialogue, but also for our EU and US partners to gradually start building a strategy which is different from what we have seen especially in 2018, when we started talking about the territorial exchange as a po potential solution between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Lajca got the dialogue at a very critical point, but it was also a very positive uh, uh, opportunity, uh, given the fact that just before Lajca took over, we literally uh, all, both elites in Kosovo and Serbia and some member states helped uh, and uh, the EU to basically get the, the um, control over the dialogue or back its driving seat as it used to be before. But the dialogue is not in crisis since 2018. If you look back, it says the Brussels agreement has been signed, which has been considered a huge success. Its implementation clearly, uh, clearly shows a different, a different story. I mean, uh, we don't recall uh, to, um, well, I'm not sure about Serbia, but in Kosovo, officially, no one has even uh, monitored properly the implementation of the agreement since 2018, because in 2018, we prepared for something that is a different uh, a solution that would potentially uh, bring down all the uh, agreements that have been signed before, as Mr. That Lychak mentioned. Uh, so um, this crisis should 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 be um, able to be overcome only with a, a very clear strategy between the U.S. and the EU, and and very fast intervention. Uh, and if we once again start dragging feet in the process with technicalities that are minor, uh, we really really uh, risk on of uh, you know having a, another cycle of ten years in which our political elites misuse the process for domestic political consumption and the EU drags its feet because it's not ready to deliver on the EU enlargement. And this, this brings me to the one key point that is important now, it's EU enlargement. Uh, unfortunately for Mr. Lajcak, <laughs> uh, the process that he is uh, facilitating uh, does not depend only on, on what the parties agree on, but also how the EU member states, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Escobar clearly mentioned, how, how uh, the EU member states, uh, uh, how much effort they put, political effort and political support to the external action service, but also to Brussels to uh, basically move on with the dialogue. Since 2011, the dialogue was, well, uh, interlinked with the EU integration process. This was believed to be a positive uh, card on the EU's hand, but apparently got out of hands. And it, it, it helped us, uh, you know, it, it helped the domestic elites to basically indulge in this uh, stabilitocracy cycle in which uh, they constantly exchange reforms on the EU integration process for stability. Uh, so uh, what is important is for the EU to make clear that enlargement is there. And blocking North Macedonia and Albania basically sends a very very, very negative message, because at the end of the day, uh, if uh, if uh, Serbia and Kosovo have been told that this will pave the EU integration process, and but you know the carrot won't exist uh, in the end of the path, I'm 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 uh, I'm afraid that there is not going to be a lot of uh, will to deliver from from the region. Unfortunately, uh, the second one is. Um, how did we build a process that is so not sustainable? It's been 10 years and we still depend on local elections. Local elections in, in Kosovo, then elections in Serbia, then elections in France and in Germany. So basically every election, this should imagine how complex this will become. Elections in the EU and it's 28, uh, 27 uh, members. And then you come to the region and then there are six, six other, you know, like Western Balkan countries, uh, which in a way can, 
can uh, have an impact on the dialogue and uh, the dynamics in the between the region and the EU. And imagine, you know, becoming uh, 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 in a way hostage of all elections processes that are ongoing. We will never ever be ready to uh, deliver on anything. Uh, and uh, the uh, third one is um, we have a new chance. I'm not sure about Serbia because what Viola mentioned that you know Vucic can use its media, but apparently he doesn't use its media on from you know uh, to to change things positively. Uh, but uh, at least from the Kosovo side, this is a new chapter in a new chapter in which we have Mr. Lajčak, Mr. Escobar, and we have Kurti and Osmani on our side. Uh, this is a unique opportunity to start a process that is transparent to not let the process be monopolized by few people like it was until 2018, because then we knew what, what we well know what's, what, what might happen. And then, you know, have a process that is inclusive. I, it is, you know, very frustrating for me as a member from civil society to see that track two is being killed gradually. Track two, uh, in terms of Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, was vibrant. We started our cooperation with our Serbian colleagues since 2012 and constantly wrote papers, monitored the process, wrote on even integration of the, of the uh, um, uh, parallel institutions in the north, security institutions. But now this is gone because if there is a fatigue and there is not a lot of investment and there is not a lot of support and inclusive approach towards these track two initiatives, not from the domestic political elites and, and, and very little from the EU. So track two is very important and societal cohesion. Um, citizens are not ready and they are not ready because they have seen that the process hasn't been delivering in the past 10 years. Citizens in Serbia, uh, get the information from the news and from the media that, that is state controlled, that is Vucic controlled. And in Kosovo, uh, the frustration with the visa liberalization process and the frustration towards the EU as a strategic partner is growing. Uh, so uh, societal cohesion is really important uh, because we can just rush and sign deals just to pretend that the process is, you know, still ongoing and is successful, but without having a very solid, sustainable agreement that is implementable, that has the support of the society, this will not be a success story. And time is working against us. We see how far right are our authoritarian tendencies in the region, and we see that the countries that we once shaped to fit in the puzzle that is called EU, it's, you know, gradually there are sort of uh, changing their shape uh, 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 on, uh, for, uh, for, for negative. So uh, I'm just hoping that uh, we understand that this is crucial. Uh, we always say this is a critical point, but this is really a critical point which can produce a unique opportunity to make history and to really close this chapter. Thank you so much, Tonika. Um, you, you mentioned that it is a critical point also uh, because of the new government, but is the new government interested in the dialogue or is it more uh, preoccupied with domestic affairs and the fight against corruption? And if so, is that a sensible or feasible course of action? That's one follow-up question. And the other one that I would like to ask you, you mentioned the need for a clear strategy between EU and US. Uh, or from EU and the US. Could you elaborate more on what that clear strategy should look like? Uh, totally, yes. The new government claimed that the dialogue is not important and it's not priority, but the first month of, you know, uh, Kurti being in power, he visited Brussels. Uh, he, he did not have bilateral uh, uh, meetings, uh, high level meetings with any of member states or just with few, but then it, the first visit was in Brussels trying to keep up with the process. For Kurti, this is a very difficult uh, adjusting process. He uh, not only uh, took over his office during the worst timing, given the COVID-19 pandemic and also the economic devastation of the country, but also uh, having you know, the dialogue at a very critical 
critical point. So for him stepping down, you know, like from uh, for stepping up from the opposition to government, it's a learning process because being opposition is very easy because you, you can tell how the process should look like, but you are not in the, the position of taking decisions and taking responsibility. So Kurti has to learn how to take responsibility in the process. And usually uh, you have to do this without thinking of the next elections without thinking of how many voters you will lose or without thinking of, 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 uh, of uh, any other, you know, like, oh, how, how, how much people will like him internally while he takes decisions that are strategic for the country. So it's a process that, uh, that is uh, going to take a while, but um, Kurti going to Brussels for me was already a success because he came from a, from a, st a standing point in which he uh, claimed he won't, you know, do any dialogue or he won't be going to, to Brussels to, uh, to uh, develop the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. And now he's there. Uh, they are working on expert level and Mr. Lajca can tell you more about that, but it means that they are meeting and they are discussing. We recently had a dis uh, uh, an agreement to, to open the archives, which then, you know, had a huge impact in Kosovo and, and reaction, of course. But, you know, like Kurti is trying to, to be part of the process gradually. It will take a while. You know, in my opinion, expert opinion, uh, when he took over I expected at least for him to be ready by next year, and this year would not be a, a good year to to strike any big deal, given given the circumstances and uh, uh, his recent uh, uh, um, uh, appointed at appointment. Um, as for the strategy, what we saw unfortunately in the past. Uh, at least during the Trump administration, was this lack of coordination between the U.S. and the EU. And this has produced many crises in Kosovo. I mean, we clearly, I mean, for the first time in my life, I've, I've, I've witnessed uh, a, a very huge crack between what we perceived as our Western allies and those that are constantly you know unified when it comes to the case at least uh, the case of Kosovo uh, and uh, and this will take a while to recover so what and and during this time there was clear lack of of uh, trust towards either one or the other partner. So what we, what were the US and the EU, I mean, Lajcak did this before with Palmer, they were in Pristina drinking coffee, stay there for a while, trying to, to, trying to send the message that, you know, we are in this together. And I think this, this shall continue uh, in the future as well, uh, at this level, at higher levels, to make sure that they send a unified message. And the unified message is the Western Balkan regions in the EU. And, uh, uh, and before that, to uh, solve all bilateral issues, including that of Bosnia. No one, you know, tackles it. And uh, in, in Kosovo, so, like, there is a huge issue also with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yes, I'm, um, we will um, maybe come back to, to that and um, hear from uh, Mr. Escobar. But um, I want to uh, open the floor for questions uh, of, and comments from our audience at this point, because uh, uh, I see we have, a, um, and, and thankfully so, we have a very active uh, um, audience today. Uh, and I already see three hands up, so I'm going to uh, first, in the order in which they appear on my screen, I'm, I'm going to first invite, invite Tanya Milevska. Hi, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tanya. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you Corina. Um, uh, my name is Tanya Milevska. I'm the Brussels correspondent for the Macedonian News Agency. And I would like to ask Mr. Lajcak and Mr. Escobar about um, North Macedonia and Bulgaria, because it does impact and it could impact eventually the Bel belgrade Pristina dialogue if, if, if the issue remains stuck as it is. So you might know, Mr. Lajcak, that today there was a new non-paper that came out in, in, in the Macedonian media and on Clan TV. Uh, discussing a new way forward to solve the issue between North Macedonia and Bulgaria. Uh, but obviously, given the situation in Bulgaria and the elections in November, nobody is hopeful that this will be resolved by the December GAC. So we are stuck uh, between Skopje and Sofia. What does this mean for the region, for North Macedonia, for the uh, Belgrade-Pristina dialogue? 
Uh, I would also like to have Mr. Escobar's uh, reaction on that. What 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 do you think of 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 the stalemate? Yeah, the stalemate. What's happening with, with with Bulgaria? And also, you said uh, you mentioned that some you would like to see more uh, uh, member states giving a stronger message on enlargement, Mr. Escobar. So, which ones? Can you name them, please? Yeah, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, Andre de Munter, would you like to come in now? Andre, are you with us? Uh, yes, Corina, can you hear me? Yes, now we can, please go ahead. Okay, uh, well, I have several questions actually, all of them for Mr. Leitchuk and they are specific and they are on, uh, on, on, on the dialogue. I mean, uh, Mr. Leitchuk, you will remember that you had an interesting exchange of views in the European Parliament with the two delegations concerned on the 22nd of March uh, with our Serbia and Kosovo delegation. And three days later, uh, the uh, Kosovo resolution initiated by uh, Ms. von Kramen was adopted. Uh, in that resolution, uh, the EAS was asked to set up a mechanism to monitor and verify the implementation of all the agreements so far reached and to report periodically to the European Parliament about the state of play. I mean, six months later, I think it is fair to ask whether there has been any follow-up to that. The same applies to what we state in paragraph 49 of the same resolution on the participation of women in the negotiating teams of Kosovo and, uh, and uh, Serbia. I was also wondering and tying in with uh, what uh, Donika said uh, rightly on, uh, well, what I would say uh, track two bleeding to death uh, more or less, I find it, uh, well, difficult to understand why there is not yet a dedicated website on such an important process as, uh, the, the, as the dialogue uh, process, uh, where the EES, uh, your services could come up with their own analysis of the implementation, the state of uh, play uh, of the implementation of the, uh, of the agreements uh, which I think in terms of communication, credibility and transparency would be a very good, uh, a very good thing. Uh, I would also have a question about uh, cooperation with parliaments. Uh, during our exchange of views in March uh, with the delegations, you also said uh, that you would uh, develop a plan uh, to have separate contacts with parliamentarians in Kosovo and uh, Serbia to try and sell what you called at the time the final product, which I like even more because it's more concise than the horrible long uh, thing that we have. Uh, uh, is, is there any uh, initiative you took to, uh, to, 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 to that end? Uh, and uh, maybe to 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 finish with, uh, I mean, a question on on the uh, the tricky issue of association and community of Serb majority municipalities and your definition of what facilitation actually means, because it was said at the time we it's up to the parties to decide what they discuss. There are no red lines. Meanwhile, we had, of course, a statement uh, on, on the uh, association community of certain majority municipalities also, and rightly so, on the, on the possible correction uh, of, of borders, which should not be part uh, of the deal. Uh, I, I mean, so what does facilitation actually uh, mean? And do you see any uh, prospect of anything moving on this issue, which is brought up time and again by uh, the Serbian uh, interlocutor? Um, Thank you. Thank and you I'm so thinking, much, I'm, I'm finishing, Corina, and I'm thinking uh, like uh, this weekend's interview of President uh, Osmani with the Süddeutsche Zeitung, where she said, uh, I mean, no way uh, such uh, an association will come about because it would be like Second Republika Srpska. I will stop here and thank you for your patience. Thank you, indeed. And this overlaps with another question we've received from Daniel Apostolovic from, um, from our audience, who is precisely asking about uh, what we make out of this statement uh, from leaders from Pristina uh, that they will never implement the Brussels Agreement um, uh, regarding the establishment of the community of Serbia Munap Munip Munip municipalities. Um, just to close this round of questions, I'd like to, um, uh, to ask Marina Max Maksimovic to come in uh, because she's been waiting for a long time and then we come back to the panel. 
Uh, hi, Corina. I, I hope that you, that you can uh, can hear me, um, and I hope that uh, yes, I, I, almost forgot, I almost forgot my questions after Andre's elaboration. Yes, of course, he was very comprehensive as always. Not at all, as always. Yeah, I, I have two questions: one for for Mr. Lychek and one for uh, for uh, Mr. Escobar. For for Mr. Lychek, um, uh, we saw uh, the last two high level rounds of dialogue here in in, in Brussels, and uh, as you said, also the only result was that they agreed to to continue the, the dialogue so um, uh, are you disappointed with this kind of uh, having no results and do you have any plan b or something you, you have uh, as as we can hear uh, the the plan to go to visit uh, belgrade and pristina if you can uh, just confirm this uh, this week to be there is there any message or any plan that you are going to to bring to belgrade and pristina something new some some new impulse in this dialogue and for mr escobar uh, mr escobar you you said somehow broadly that uh, you will uh, support uh, you uh, EU in this uh, uh, Belgrade Pristina dialogue, but can you be a little bit concrete? Uh, what will be some of your steps, maybe with Mr. Lychak, maybe alone uh, in, in, in the process of uh, pushing this uh, Belgrade and Pristina dialogue move forward? Thank you. Thank you, Marina. I'll come back to you, Augustine, and to the other questions, some of the other questions that have been raised in written in the second round. But now let's turn uh, to our speakers. Um, who would like to come in first? Um, uh, Mr. Lajak, just to uh, change a little bit the order, would you like to, um, uh, to cherry pick on some of the questions that have been addressed to you? Sure, absolutely. I hope there will be still some time left for other panelists because I received so many questions and there are also a couple of points I wanted to re re react to from what was said by Donika and by uh, uh, Ms. von Gramon. Uh, uh, in more general terms, you know, I like to quote uh, uh, the famous statement by Nelson Mandela, who said, it always looks impossible until it's done. Uh, and that's my philosophy. I'm a manager, I'm a doer. When I see a problem, I'm looking for a solution, not for an excuse. Yes, I'm aware of political calendar. I'm aware of all these dates. I'm aware of all these elections. I'm aware of the uh, fluid list of the EU priorities. Yes, but is this a reason or an excuse to do nothing? Certainly not. And again, the question I always ask my colleagues, what's the alternative? Give me a better alternative. If you give me a better alternative than the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia, good regional cooperation and European integration, I will give up. But there is, there is no better alternative. So that means we need to work towards achieving this alternative. Uh, and I, am, I can assure you that the European Union will deliver. Will deliver on the visas for Kosovo, which is long overdue. Will deliver on enlargement. But it will not help us to sit idly wait and eventually complain. We need to change the list of priorities. We need to con contribute to the change, changing of the list of priorities. How? Through reforms, through sincere commitment, to by acting in a way which makes it very clear that we are 100% committed. We don't speculate. We have no other alternatives. We play no other games. And with our membership, European Union will not become less functional because the functionality has become a big issue in the European Union right now. So this is, I see lots of co co complaints in the region. And on one hand, I can understand that. But again, this will not, this will not help. Ro let's roll up our sleeves and let's work. There is no alternative to the normalization of relations unless Kosovo and Serbia want to get stuck forever in the status quo, which I'm sure nobody wants. So there is no reason to wait. There is no reason to postpone. There is no re re reason to drag on uh, anyone's feet or, or, or to obstruct even the process. The sooner we finish the process, the better for the citizens, for people in Kosovo, in Serbia, of the region, and of course, also the, the, the better for the European integration of the region. So uh, let's focus on how we can get things done rather than to, to to complain about uh, what, what is currently outside of our control. We can change things. Uh, so th this is one thing, uh, like a general, uh, uh, what I wanted to, to make. I also want to say that uh, 
there are no tech, there is no technical dialogue and there are no technical issues. There are no technicalities. Everything is very political. We, I just had uh, two chief negotiators, Mr. Besnik Beslimi and Petr Petkovic in Brussels last week. We spent many, many hours over two days. There was not a single technical issue. Everything has po political impact. So, so uh, uh, it, there, there is a dialogue at the level of leaders. There is a dialogue at the le level of chief negotiators, but the dialogue is, is uh, utterly political. I, uh, uh, I'm not sure there is a, like uh, uh, what I heard about the uh, track uh, two that having died out or bleeding. I, what I see are rather multiple track two initiatives. And uh, I, we are always, first of all, I don't think anyone prevents uh, the civil societies from Kosovo and Serbia of sitting together, generating idea and com ideas coming to us uh, with those ideas. Uh, second, I, uh, as a rule, I accept invitations to discussions like yours, uh, because it's really important that you understand what we do, and uh, I hear from you, how can I do my job better? So I, uh, uh, if, if, uh, I, I just don't understand who killed the track to initiative, because I am always open to receive new ideas and, and new inputs, and, and I think no one really prevents you from, from reaching out to each other. Uh, with regard to North Macedonia and Bulgaria, of course, it has an impact on, on the dialogue and the impact is negative because uh, the fact that we were unable to open accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania hit negatively the credibility of the European Union in the region. And I'm saying this because I, have, I was confronted with this multiple times during my meetings and du during my trips and uh, it will not improve unless and until we start the accession negotiation with North Macedonia and Bulgaria. There is no doubt about it. Uh, it's important for, for uh, the European Union to demonstrate that when uh, our partners deliver, we deliver too. We have a political reality in uh, Bulgaria that successive parliamentary relations did not produce a government with a political mandate, with a clear and strong political mandate. And I, and this is my personal also political experience uh, that says right now at this point, we really have to wait to get a, a, a government with a mandate uh, that, that, that can, uh, and we can solve and we should solve the issue, overcome the, the blockage uh, without any, any delay. Uh, I also want to say that uh, Europe, we, my team and my colleagues from the European institutions, uh, European External Action Service, European Commission, uh, and together with the Council, we are regularly monitoring the progress on the dialogue I have a very detailed list of uh, outstanding commitments for both Kosovo and Serbia. And I, I am presenting this list to my partners regularly when they are in Brussels. They know exactly what they need to do. Uh, and we are discussing uh, very openly about the issues where they have uh, questions or uh, I would say they, they want to clarify certain things. We are also reporting regularly to member states. We have a, a separate mechanism, uh, the special normalization committee with Kosovo, and we have the uh, chapter 35 un, 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 under the, the stabilization association agreement with Serbia. And through so these two mechanisms, member states are regularly informed about the progress of, in the dialogue. I am uh, in, a, I would say, regular communication with the European Parliament, uh, different formations, uh, AFED, or the political parliamentary group, or the, uh, the uh, MEPs who are dealing with the Western Balkans, every time I'm invited, I always come, or, or we always communicate, and we have even, of course, above this, uh, I, I would say, our dialogue with uh, Ms. von Kramon is uh, even more intense, because we are also meeting uh, bilaterally on this. So. Uh, uh, this is, I, I really believe that no one can say that uh, they don't know enough. At the same time, and I have to repeat it, we need to find the right balance between the transparency of the process and the confidentiality of talks. We are discussing super sensitive issues. We are discussing super sensitive issues and not everything can be done through the <laughs> calls like this one. You have to trust your delegations. You have, they have their mandate, I have mine. And as I said, I, have, I, 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 I think I am as open and transparent as one can be, but uh, we also have to protect the process. Yes, there is a dedicated website uh, uh, on the EAS uh, web page you can find 
everything that is possible to be uh, to be published there. But as I said, parties know exactly, member states know exactly, and the parliamentarians who are interested, European parliamentarians know as well. I will travel to Pristina later this week, uh, leaving uh, Wednesday morning. I will spend three days in Kosovo. Uh, as part of my program, I will also meet with the uh, uh, Speaker of the Parliament, Mr. Konyufca, and uh, with the representatives of uh, uh, political party caucuses in, in the Parliament. And then uh, I will follow with my visit to Belgrade. So it's my regular uh, visits to the region. And again, it's the, with the discussion with leaders uh, about how to take the process forward, uh, and which this is what I, I consider uh, very important. And uh, what the European facilitation or the EU facilitation means, uh, I, I said that this is definitely more than just uh, taking notes, because we are here to pro make sure that whatever is agreed is deeply grounded in the European principles and values. And every agreement it will bring both parties, Kosovo and Serbia, closer to the European Union. So this is how I see uh, and, and, uh, the role of the European Union in this process. And I have exp expressed myself on the issue of uh, border changes many times. I don't think, uh, I think I was as clear as uh, one can uh, be, so I don't need to repeat, you know my views. And uh, uh, also the Pacta Sun Servanta principle is uh, something that, uh, is a, one of the pillars of, of international relations. That means what was agreed must be implemented. And, and this is also a principle which is valid in these parties. The final outcome of this process is in the hands of the two parties. Uh, so it's, it's their process, they want it, they must want it, they need it. If they are serious about European integration, if they, if they are serious about the, the better uh, living standards for the people, uh, and we are here to help, and we are here to offer all the expertise. and. Uh, I hope it is a good career opportunity for members of my team. When it comes to me, I see this as a, an opportunity to offer 30 years of my experience as diplomat and a foreign minister, someone who has desperately hoped for his own country to join the European Union and has worked toward this goal, someone who has enjoyed membership in the European Union for uh, 20, 17, 18 years now, to bring all this experience to help uh, bring the European uh, reality European membership to the countries of the Western Balkans, because I really believe in European future for the Western Balkans, and that's my motivation. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, just to reiterate that we are very grateful uh, for your presence in this kind of discussions, uh, and we're happy that we can count um, uh, on uh, on your contribution to um, uh, to these kind of exchanges. Um, the the only thing I, I would maybe add is that you mentioned that um, uh, the the two sides don't don't want to get um, to, to be stuck into this forever. But I would I would say that the EU um, uh, it's it's not a, um, a desirable position for the EU either. So the EU doesn't want to be uh, stuck in, in this either. So we, we need to find a solution and move uh, uh, forward together. It's, um, it's a mu mutual interest and benefit. Yeah. That, that, um, sorry, I just one sentence. That, that's exactly the philosophy be, behind creating of the position of the EU special representative. The EU, this leadership of the European Union uh, uh, came to a conclusion that after 10 years, it's time not only to continue the process, but also to bring it to a close, to a successful end. And this is this is what is expected from us, and this is what we are working on 24-7. Yes. And um, maybe we, ha if we have um, a more time towards the end, we should discuss a little bit the, the the final outcome and what what that might mean. But because you you've mentioned the EP and um, and uh, Ms. von Kramen, then I'd, I'd maybe want to come uh, to you next, um, including to ask you if you could um, address this issue of gender balance in the dialogue that has been raised. Uh, perhaps you're. Um, <laughs> You're interested to pick on on that issue, but also anything else to which you might want to to react. Thank you, Corina, and uh, thanks also to Mr. Lightcheck for for answering so comprehensively, <laughs> almost to all the questions which Andre has uh, raised before, and and the other participants, of course. Uh, well, I mean, the gender questions is still there, and we have not settled. We haven't solved it, um, um, solved it, and um, well, I think uh, we should be more precise on what we expect from this side. Uh, 
of course, so far it's it's mainly male dominated. Uh, the fast uh, the track two uh, could be also more uh, focused and more uh, established with female representatives. I would say, but also I think in the in the main negotiation team uh, we would expect uh, more women. But I'm not so sure on the on both sides because we know the negotiators themselves. Uh, they are men, but I'm not so sure about the entire team for now. So I would be a bit more cautious to say there are no women, but of course not enough and not visible and not in the decisive position. That's for sure. And that's a problem, I would say, while we see at least on both sides, when you talk to uh, women's organizations, representatives, that where they are always very close. They have had contacts all the time, even during the war. Uh, there was no friction amongst them. And this is, I think, we should use uh, for uh, the reconciliation process much more and much more in, in, intensely. And maybe one more remark from my side. I think the Bulgarian Macedonian, North Macedonian question is crucial. And uh, I've talked to some Bulgarians on the weekend and they said it should be easy to find a face uh, saving solution uh, for that process, because this really blocks the entire enlargement process and we couldn't don't let it go, we could not uh, let it uh, drain in that way. And Yes, of course, we have to wait now, but otherwise, uh, I had the impressions when this all started by Borisov, not really by himself, but but, but by some of the uh, politicians from Bulgaria, and now there are more only 80% of the population behind this craziness, that nobody in the European Union felt really responsible for solving that. While, of course, in, in, uh, with, Greek, uh, with Greece and uh, Bulgaria, it took 10 years and North Macedonia took 10 years to settle this. We do not have the time. So I would ask the ESS to go on this, to really find a solution, to find a format for this. Any kind of a Jean Mondé dialogue would help uh, to go as quickly as possible and, 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 and get a negotiation team and go to the um, respected countries and find solution, no matter we have a mandate in Bulgaria, but also, I mean, uh, come up with uh, some, some proposals um, even before the elections and really make sure that the, um, the, the groups uh, or the parties uh, would uh, would be in favor or would, uh, would would strengthen that. And my last question maybe also to Mr. Leitscher would be, um, I think you should use the opportunity to address some of our messages from the European Union to the assemblies, to the National Assembly of Kosovo, but also to the Parliament of Serbia. We should use all our leverage, all our influence, all what is on the European institutional side to address it to a broader um, uh, public. And I, I fully share that some of the negotiations might be and should be confidential, yes. But the main message, uh, while I see that, of course, it is very much politicized from both parties, maybe needs a broader and a more political and a more, let's say, celebrity, uh, um, um, yeah, I don't know, framework or, or circumstances or environment, atmosphere, something like this. Um, and, and this would be good if we could maybe uh, find um, also a common speech for this, but maybe this is just a, uh, a little remark from my side. Otherwise, I see that the monitoring process, for example, with the European Parliament, of course, there is a continuous or permanent exchange, but there's not a systematic monitoring process for increasing the transparency uh, for all the participants, but also for uh, the citizens on the ground. If we could implement something like this, more visible and uh, easier to follow. This, of course, uh, would also increase the trust in the process. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Escobar, um, I come to you. Thank you for, uh, for your patience. Uh, and um, I give you the floor for any reactions or answers you wish to, to provide to the questions raised. Sure. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, just, I'll be brief on the two questions that were addressed to me. Number one. Uh, on the North Macedonia, Bulgaria question, it should be resolved immediately. And it should be resolved in a way that allows North Macedonia to continue on the path where they've already worked so hard to, to, make, uh, to make gains. Um, I agree with my 
panelists, colleagues, that you know this bilateral issue should not stop the entire enlargement process. Um, and I hope that the European Union finds a mechanism by which they can resolve this um, on the, uh, the the how the United States concretely hopes to, to support the uh, the dialogue. Uh, on the public messaging, we will message at every uh, opportunity that we support uh, the efforts of, of Mr. Lychak. Uh, and potentially, I, I don't exclude COVID permitting that uh, I would uh, welcome the opportunity to do a trip with him to the region uh, and to meet with leaders and meet with, uh, with the, the individual uh, parties. On a concrete way, uh, the State Department, through uh, our embassies in Pristina and Belgrade, will work to make sure that the agreements that are reached are implemented. Uh, and we'll be watching very closely. We'll encourage the leaders to um, devote their energies to the dialogue and not their energies to uh, trying to circumvent or, or uh, avoid the dialogue. That uh, they uh, implement fully any agreements that they that they uh, or their predecessors have agreed to under the, the Brussels process. So those are two ways in which I, I hope to be helpful uh, to the process. Thank you so much. Danica, would you like to come in briefly before we take a couple more questions before we close? Just a small remark. I mean, of course, on the women being uh, included, but that's not up to the EU. Unfortunately, it's the countries that actually decide on who is going to uh, be in the lead negotiating team. So far, no women is in, in uh, on the side of Kosovo. We were hoping that at least Vyos uh, Osmani uh, as the president of Kosovo would have a more proactive role in the dialogue, regardless of the fact that, of course, you know, Kurti, according to the constitutional court decision, is the one to lead the process. But uh, this doesn't exclude the fact that in Kosovo, there were um, a lot of uh, expectations that she would be also actively included in the process. Uh, uh, as for the track two, women usually play a crucial role there. Uh, usually, you know, think tank academia, but also track three, which is dealing with community. And, uh, and this has to be further uh, supported. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, no one has killed it, but you know, the lack of support in a way kills it uh, implicitly. So, so uh, more support from the EU uh, and donor coordination would be uh, really uh, helpful in this regard. And uh, one last remark on, on the ownership. I mean, um, uh, the, it's not about the website of the EU. I mean, that's not transparency. The, the uh, agreements you can find on the Kosovo government website, Serbia, and also the external action service, it's about the ownership and the process. The EU is not just there to offer um, uh, expertise. We have a lot of experts. They use to to offer not just the tables. We have a lot of those, but it's to offer the you know the political will behind alongside the U.S. to actually push the processes forward. Unfortunately, I agree. I agree with uh, Viola. Uh, we we should have done this for ourselves. But we don't. So that's why it's con conditionality. That's why the EU integration process. That's why it's an externally driven process. So, so more ownership from the EU to step, you know, kind of up from the facilitation process and role and to become more proactive uh, party in, in the process would help a lot more uh, in, in this regard. I know that this, this is more complex for people who know the EU <laughs> wouldn't ask for this, <laughs> but uh, uh, um, unfortunately, this is the case in the region. Thank you, Danica. Um, I want to put two, maximum three other questions on the table and come back to the panelists with one minute per person to, to have a reaction before we close so that we can close on time. And um, I'm giving the floor to Augustin first for his comment or question. Augustin, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, uh, I can hear you, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, they will need more than one minute to answer my questions, <laughs> especially since uh, you asked the right question to a wrong person. You asked uh, Viola von Kramon whether uh, uh, mutual recognition should be a final goal. This uh, uh, should not be a question for Parliament because European Parliament supported independence even before it was declared. Uh, we remember. Uh, Marty Ahtisari's efforts. Uh, Mr. Escobar mentioned uh, that he supports the efforts. Uh, all EU member states were supporting efforts of 
Ahtisari, but once he produced a proposal, then some countries didn't support this proposal and they don't support it even today, country where Mr. Lycha comes from uh, being one of them. But anyway, uh, I, I hope after 11 years of following this dialogue as a journalist, and I will not speak much about transparency, we can have a special uh, conference on that, but there was only one time in 11 years, one time shortly where two leaders of two parties came together in the press point without asking question, uh, answering questions. And this would be an opportunity for us because uh, uh, EU should facilitate uh, us, facilitate the uh, citizens to understand what's going on. But at least let's hope that there is something uh, 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 this part that they cannot speak about that they are close to the uh, uh, final agreement otherwise i was never big optimist uh, uh, but uh, i never thought that after 11 years i'll be hearing uh, still uh, parties speaking about car plates uh, energy energy bills uh, and so on those are all important but uh, i was hoping that uh, they might be close to the conclusion so the question is again for mr escobar what do you support uh, really, because EU doesn't have a position. If Mr. Leitchak, understandably, is not in a position to say that recognition should be a final solution, then uh, because he has to ask all 27 in order to be able to say that, and he cannot say that, what do you support then? And uh, uh, to Mr. Leitchak, um, because the Serbian uh, politicians are always saying, yeah, okay, uh, Angela Merkel said it, uh, Joe Biden said it, uh, that uh, uh, recognition should be a solution. We don't need recognition by Kosovo, uh, but uh, we never heard this from EU. EU never said that recognition should be uh, a solution. So uh, my question is again, however uh, uh, boring question it is, is the recognition the final outcome of this dialogue? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Augustine. And to that, I will uh, ask, uh, I will take two more questions out of the many, many that have been posed in the um, in the box. And I apologize that we cannot cover everything uh, in uh, in the short time that we have together. It's another question for Mr. Escobar. It's coming from Isabel Ioannides, who is asking, um, Mr. Escobar, you have concentrated on economic normalization. Is it fair to assume that such cooperation will not be value-free as under Trump's policy? And could you please explain what the recent, recent executive order of the Biden administration to tackle corruption in the Balkans and obstruction to the region's peace agreements, democratic processes, and human rights looks like in practice? And finally, I will only mention um, one other question from Klaus Klipp, who is asking, um, Mr. Leitchak, but I guess um, we can pose it to the um, entire panel for, for uh, the final round. What makes you believe that the business as usual or the, the way of conducting business now will be more successful than during all of the past 10 years? I will leave it there. I'm sorry we couldn't cover um, everyone's uh, interests. Um, and I will start from Mr. Escobar. Okay, I'll be very brief to stick to my, uh, to my one minute and I will uh, unfortunately have to leave it exactly at 1030. But uh, let me start by saying that uh, the, the goal is not only mutual recognition, it is European Union membership, full stop. So the region should be at, at peace should be whole and it should be uh, functional and should be part of the European Union. So there's a lot of parts to that. On the question of democratization and rule of law, we have a multi-million dollar assistance budget that is focused just on that because as I said, we want Europe to recognize that these countries are a good risk. We want the countries of the region to recognize that, that Europe is a good future for them. And by making the uh, the by meeting the requirements, much of which is on rule of law, they will live better, they will function better, and they will give on the economic side greater predictability to um, to the businesses that come to invest there. Uh, so th those are the uh, the key points. I also saw one on there about the Washington Agreement, um, and I should uh, I should mention one thing on that. 
that yes, they are valid. We believe in them. And the one thing that was very interesting about the Washington agreements is I wouldn't say that they're value free. Uh, we recognize that the hard political questions are being handled within the dialogue, but we were trying to do with the Washington agreement was to create some confidence building measures on the economic side that we're able to show that you can address some cooperation without addressing the uh, the status question. And we were successful in, in getting the parties to recognize that. That's why the economic piece for me is important as a confidence building measure and as a multi-ethnic uh, reconciliatory measure. But the focus will be on the dialogue and we support it. And with that, I apologize, but I'm gonna have to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Many thanks indeed. Mr. Lechak. Yes, it's difficult to fit into one minute. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, speaking about the goal, uh, you know, I'm the only member of the panel who uh, has a clear mandate. Uh, so you can express your views. I am, I, uh, I, I am bound by my mandate, which says, uh, uh, to facilitate uh, the agreement on the comprehensive normalization of relations uh, between Kosovo and Serbia. And uh, uh, it's uh, the process in, is in the hands of the parties. I can also add that uh, the, the way I read my mandate, it should bring the full international acknowledgement and acceptance of Kosovo, full internal consolidation and control over, over its territory, significant progress on the European Union integration on the EU path, and along with it to create jobs to boost the economy and to help address the rule of law, rule of law issues. I will uh, need your help. And uh, what uh, Ms. von Kramon said, uh, I would comment, I would add, we need a societal understanding. We need a societal support. Uh, I need a support and understanding with from political parties, from civil society, from media. I'm trying to reach out to them both in, in Kosovo and in Serbia as much as I can, but I need your help. Uh, for that, because don't forget that I uh, also have the member states to make sure that they know what I'm doing and to, to assure that I have their full support. I am very much in favor of the largest possible participation of women. There are women on the in the room every time, uh, not in the most visible positions. As, as Donika said, it's not up to the EU. We, there has always been the rule uh, uh, that we, we do not dictate the parties who should represent them. But of course, European Union position is very clear. And uh, finally, about the ownership of the process. Look, uh, the objective of, the, of the, this process is to bring both Kosovo and Serbia closer to the Euro European Union, basically to, uh, as close as the full membership uh, means. Uh, we are doing our part. I, as you know, I'm meeting with my partners. I'm traveling to the region. I'm meeting with them in Brussels. But again, we do not force anyone. This is not how European Union operate. A forced solution. Uh, would not be su sustainable. And of course, we must not uh, act as if we push partners into doing something they don't want to do or they don't agree to. This would, this would not be sustainable. In the end of the day, it's not the European Union's agreement or Washington DC's agreement. It's an agreement between Kosovo and Serbia about normalization of their relations. They have to own it. They have to explain it to their people. They have to defend it and they have to implement it. And we will do our part but uh, uh, let's let's be very clear about what process are we talking about. So uh, every uh, assistance I can get from you is more than desirable and more than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, for the last two minutes, first minute to Ms. Kremen. Any any final remarks? Well, well, my final remarks. I mean, I can easily agree to what Mr. Lajcak has said, uh, the ownership. I mean, a lot is in the hand of the politicians, of the interlocutors on the ground. Of course, we need to see their political uh, commitment much more than in the last uh, month and weeks. But I do understand why they, of course, uh, uh, let's say, uh, negotiating with their how we say uh, the weather with the weather like a handbrake uh, in, in, in that moment. But I really hope uh, that in a few weeks we see a different attitude, we see more commitment and not just as Donika has said on, on technical um, uh, details, even they are important and even sometimes they make a difference. Um, on the other hand, I would also ask 
Mr. Lightcheck and our interlocutors to really, I mean, if you see there is not enough ownership, but you know it is crucial for the region to get this breakthrough to put more conditionality on the process. Because I know that a lot of people would like to see this. They see us as not just as a facilitator, but as guidance for the region. And they would really like to see much more, let's say, deeper engagement than just facilitating. I do understand that you think your mandate is limited, but on the other hand, I know that the majority in both of the countries uh, would like to see more progress, more engagement, more active role in, in, in even pushing for, for some things. So far, we are in the European Parliament very much on your side. We support everything which is done from the US side, but it was of course uh, from, from the ESS side. And therefore, I'm looking very much forward to further cooperation and um, to supporting your um, engagement there. Great, thank you. The final word to you, Donika. Um, yeah, just final remark, status quo is not a solution. I mean, it might look okay because the parties are not fighting and it looks like, you know, the process is ongoing and the meetings in Brussels are, you know, a, pro, uh, a, a tick the box exercise from uh, both the EU side and the uh, Kosovo and Serbia side. Um, I believe that, um, um, as I said in the beginning, first we deal with a big issue and then bilaterally the countries, of course, in the EU, uh, in the framework of the EU integration process, solve the bilateral issues that are open between them. Uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, pretty much for me, uh, yeah. just, you know, like status quo, it's not a success and it should not be perceived as a success. And we should start talking about big issues and then gradually build the stamina to address all small issues between not just Kosovo and Serbia, but also among other countries in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Very, very grateful for your very frank and uh, passionate interventions at the end of the day. Um, I want to uh, apologize to our participants that I, we couldn't cover all of the questions and all of the points that uh, very interesting and important points that we've raised. But this is not the end of the conversation on this topic. This is an ongoing process. We will return to it and we hope to see as many of uh, you here present again in the future. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon and see you soon at um, EPC event. Bye-bye.